I forgot to introduce myself before. My name is Claire Bradley. I am part of the family who own and run Agrisy. My mother-in-law and my mother-in-law Jill and my father-in-law Keith. Keith, give us a wave down the back. <laughs> they started the company over 22 years ago. I'm the second generation who run the company with my husband Tani, who I think is probably hiding outside near the sausages. <laughs> There's a number of other Agrisi um, teammates here with us today, so if you've got any questions, direct them their way. <laughs> um, so after lunch, we're going to go out into the field. Uh, it would be really good if we carpool, uh, so rather than having 100 cars go that way. It would be great just to have 50 or 20. Um, first up, I'm not a farmer. I'm not an agronomist. I'm not a soil scientist. I spent uh, over two years in the Amazon rainforest researching ecosystems. And I guess it's there that I got to understand and appreciate that if you take something out of a system or put it in, there's a huge flow on effect. So when we're looking at doing research at Agrisi, we try and take that in mind. We try and look at the whole farm system, the whole orchard system. Because when we look at things in a reductionist way, we might add our nitrogen and we get our extra dry matter, which is fantastic. What happens to our root growth? What happens to our pasture quality? What happens to our animal health? What happens to our profitability? And if you don't look at all those things as a whole, you don't get the full picture. So really it's when you assess that whole picture you get to understand the sustainability and economic viability of a system. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Agrisy, what we do, what we make, why we do it, and also go through some of the um, data that I've collected over the last three years. So you would have got the research handout that I gave out. That's kind of quite preliminary. Um, I just got the last data set in on Thursday. So I've spent the weekend kind of Christine and I having a fair it through. Um, I'm not here to tell you and give you all the answers. I'm here to show you what I've found. I didn't come into this research project saying, Maya, Jenny, we're going to grow you lots of grass, we're going to solve all your problems. I didn't know what's going to happen on a forestry conversion block, pumice soils, and take the nitrogen off, take all the fertilizers off, and add a biostimulant. I wanted to find out what happens in this climate on this farm. So it was an investigation. So a little bit about Agrisy. As I said, it was started over 20 years ago. It was actually made um, for home gardeners. And as word got out about how amazing this product that Keith and Jill were making, people like Rose Gardeners wanted to buy it. I think the first uh, kind of commercial entity that was buying was Kiwi Fruit. And Jill and Keith kind of looked at themselves, I guess, when you're giving seaweed to a diverse system such as an organic garden or a home garden with all these veggies growing in, you can see the benefits, it's amazing. But we didn't know what's got, what it was happen on a monoculture commercial crop. So that was our first <coughs> investigation into research. It was across five orchards, across three years, and it got incredible results such as increased fruit size, reduced rots, better fruit quality, higher bricks, the list goes on. As we've grown as a company, we've had more and more industries come our way. So we've had the grape industry, for example. There we are, shovel money into that industry and make sure we know what we're doing and we're adding value to their business. Currently, we supply over 65% of the country's vineyards with seaweed biostimulants. Um, so horses, crops, dairy cows, there we go. Another industry decided to come along and they wanted to use our seaweed as well. So our, our study into dairy nutrition is across 1,500 cows across commercial dairy herds in Waikato. We don't have time to go into that today, but see me later if you want to. The bee industry, that's something that has just recently come our way in the last uh, three to four years. Uh, we've got a, a good government grant working with Plant and Food Research looking at the effects um, feeding our seaweed nutritional formula with the sugar syrup and what the effects are on the honeybee health and productivity of the honey and so on. So as you can see, we've kind of grown brick by brick, farmer by farmer, industry by industry, people really wanting to have a look at what our products do and how they add value. So what I should say is our products are not a fertilizer. They are classed as a biostimulant. 
Eye stimulants is a huge growing international market. It's growing over 15% year on year. There are world conferences held. The last one in November was attended by Ravensdown. The previous one was attended by Balance. It is the new wave of agriculture because we're not finding we're getting the returns from more and more fertilizer. So people are starting to look at things like biostimulants. <coughs> biostimulants work in a different way. They're not designed to add nutrients to your soil. They're designed to stimulate your soil plant relationship. So this is uh, some of the peer reviewed international research coming out of the biostimulants conference. Seaweed biostimulants will increase root formation, total root volume, root length, stimulate nutrient uptake, increase microbial diversity, increase our lovely mycorrhizal fungi, increase our soluble protein content, and help with abiotic stresses including drought salinity and temperature extremes. So you'll see there that this is all research, recent research. We're not looking at research done in the 30s, the 40s. This is the new frontier. So why would you use seaweed for animal health? Seaweed, especially New Zealand seaweeds, it's funny that, you know, especially our honey, especially our seaweed, especially we've got fantastic products here. But it is one of the most complex materials known to man. It is hugely diverse and complex. It has all your macro micronutrients, it's got vitamins, natural sugars, fatty acids, amino acids, it's bioavailable, it's not expensive urine. I don't know if you've ever taken too many um, nutritional tablets or supplements and watch what comes out the other end. It's a waste of money. Uh, fluorotannins, polysaccharides, and lots of bioactive phytochemicals. So are all seaweed products the same? The short answer is no. Uh, many, most seaweed products in this country are imported. And you'll see that increasing science is coming up with bioactive phytochemicals and people are gathering seaweed and extracting things off for nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, it's in your toothpaste, it's in your wound care, it's in your ice cream, it's everywhere. What they sell you is the byproduct. What they sell you is the powdered leftover seaweed after they've taken everything good out of it. So no, not all seaweeds are created equal. If you're ever looking to buy a seaweed product, what seaweed is it? What species is it? How well is it researched? How is it made? If it's kiln dried over 36 degrees, you've lost your vitamins. Ask, can you smell the sea in it? Where is it collected from? How is it harvested? Is it sustainably harvested? Is this a byproduct? Ask those questions. So now we're getting on to what we're doing here. So how many people have we got here from the district? Raise your hands. Yep, cool, awesome. So how many of you saw this farm back in 2012 when Myra and Jenny bought it? So these photos I won't, won't surprise you too much then. <laughs> so, so this is the, now the multi-species cover, the crop that we're going to be looking at today. So there was a lot of work. They had a lot of work cut out for them. This was actually in 2015, in May 2015, my first visit. I don't know how well you can see that, and that's, that's our roots. And I know I'll get in a bit of trouble for saying this, but um, part of me has wanted to have a drought in the last couple of years. <laughs> Only so I can see what happens when we've got really good root growth and good organic matter happening. I know, I washed my mouth out, it's terrible. But we haven't, so that's, that's good, that's great. So looking at our treatments, what we've done here, you've all got that handout, so um, it just gives you a bit of an overview of, of what we've actually done here on this farm. Um, in our conventional paddocks, these are our kind of average values of our inputs that we've had on each year. Um, and on our seaweed only paddock, our agri sea only paddocks, they've had each year 15 litres of soil nutrition, 15 litres of pasture nutrition. That's it. So, when I first met Myra and Jenny and came out here, um, 
we'd set up a couple of paired side-by-side -side paddocks, put all the product on, came back five months later and I said, oh, how's it going? He said, oh, I haven't really noticed a difference except for the split paddock. I'm like, split paddock? Well, we're doing a split paddock. Okay, we're doing a split paddock now. The so Maya just goes and does all these little experiments on his own, which is great. But you may or may not see in this light, um, but there's quite a distinct line here that we saw immediately. Um, my said, oh, it's just this one paddock where I've done the split paddock. It's kind of like a dark green on one side and quite yellow on the other. So this is actually urea and progib on this side. Um, and it was really stalky. Um, so it was, immediately we did get some kind of good chlorophyll action happening here. So this is um, after five months into seaweed. <coughs> so after our first lot of sampling, we kind of um, had a little look at what was going on. Uh, we had quite large increases in pH just on those because the, you can see here this is a split paddock. It came in last because I didn't have a baseline because I didn't know about it. So this, this is our baseline now. <laughs> um, so you can see oh, you know, some big increases in pH where the, we've had the seaweed biostimulant. I've got a doubling in availability of magnesium immediately after the first applications have gone on. And the aluminium, which is toxic to soil roots, it's hugely decreased where they've stayed the same. So this is um, our potentially available nitrogen. I haven't updated this slide since the end of, end of last year. Um, I ran out of time this morning. But the thing that I, I didn't know, and, and like I said, I'm not an agronomist, I'm not a soil scientist, I'm not a farmer, so there's plenty, many, probably many people in this room who can answer this better than me. But if I'm putting on phased in, 120 kilos on the 3rd of May, and I've got some more nitrogen and things going on here. I mean, I've got double the amount of available nitrogen where no nitrogen has been applied. Same happened here. Same in this paddock. Where's it coming from? You haven't put any there. I mean, I'm just showing you what I'm finding on this farm. Like I said, I don't have the answers. I'm just here to try and make you think. So Maya said to me, all, all his friends said, you'll have no um, Olsen P after three years. I said, let's, let's have a look. I said, let's go to four years. Let's have a look what happens then. Let's, I, I want to know. Let's have a look. Um, and I also said, why are you still putting on P? You got Olsen P of 70. He didn't know. I didn't give him the data, so it wasn't his bad decision. So. But he said, I'm just putting on what the fertilizer rep tells me I need to put on based on my dry matter and milk production. What I'm taking off the system, I need to add back in. That's what it's told. That's what we're taught. 92, 104. You get a soil test and you hold it up and you see Olsen P up here and you see everything else unavailable. No Olsen, no phosphorus has gone on these green paddocks. So we've gone from 47, 50 here. This is a February sampling, so it's a little bit different. And when I show you the next graphs, you'll see the seasonal variation. But on where you've had uh, phosphorus applied, you've, you've bottomed out at seven. In the paired site where you've only had seaweed, you've stayed at 17. You've actually got more phosphorus there. You're actually better off in the summer You've got more there where none has been applied. So this is just looking at that seasonal variability. I looked at a study that was done by Ants Roberts in the 80s, and I um, put it into that uh, handout that I gave you all. And it was looking at soil test variability. And in the end, they say, you can, you can look it up. Um, in the end, they say that um, if the aim of soil test variability is to find out when nutrients are at their lowest, this is when you should soil test. You should soil test after summer or between um, June and August. When do you get your soil test done on your farm? When everything's at their lowest. Yeah, I wonder why. This is no phosphorus added. It's following the exact same trend. This is just the split paddock, side by side, half and half. 
Then we go to the next paired site, we've got the same trend. We go to the next paddock, same trend. And in fact, we've got better or the same Olsen peas where no phosphorus has been applied. Not here. And not here. But we have... We haven't lost it. It hasn't disappeared. Yes, we're slightly bit lower, but we, you know, we've got seasonal variation happening here. We've increased our Olsen P over three years there when none's been applied. So when do you test? When do you soil test? How many of you have done a soil test yourself? It's really easy. It's really easy. You can ring hills and you can say, can you send me a do-it-yourself kit to soil and herbage test? If you want to, you know then you've done a good transect across your paddock and got a great cross-section of what's actually happening at the right time of the year. It's easy. So how do you test? Are you getting 20 cores in your soil test? You need to make sure you're getting 20 cores in your soil test. Don't go out and get one or two in the worst or best part of the paddock. And why do you test? Why are you testing? What is the point? What, what, is, what are you looking for? You've got an answer for me, Taylor. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the cows need that magnesium, eh? You're onto it, buddy. Yeah. Good stuff. You can come to all my classes. <laughs> So potassium, so we're told um, that we can't hold K in the soil at all. Pumice soil, no, nah, can't get potassium in it. Can't do that, got to add it. So we've added no potassium to this green line. Um, we've had potassium applications on the red line in October 16 and March 17. So October 16, we were going up anyway. We've got our response. March 17, so where are we? About here. Oh, where, where is that response? I don't know, but anyway. This is the next paired site. This is again potassium. No potassium added. No potassium added. You can't keep potassium in pumice soils. Apparently you can. This is the next paired site. This is the split paddock. We've got our October 16, potassium, held it there, March 17, where are we here, aren't we? Oh, we've dipped, I don't know, I don't know. So this is, this is a 75 millimetre testing um, I did in October 2017. Um, this is paddocks 53 and 54. By the way, when we go out and to see paddock 53 and 54, 53 was the best pasture that side of the farm, it's the newest pasture, it's a high sugar ryegrass. So when I was doing visual soil assessments, you always look at, you do a pasture assessment, you look at a whole lot of uh, visual pas pasture scores. And if you've ever seen a visual soil assessment book by Graham Shepard, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then you do your soil assessment. This, this always looked quite good, oh, sorry, 53. This always looked really good visually. And I went and had a little look um, in terms of the soil fertility. So we've just been putting on this here. And then I went, oh, hold on, calcium, okay. Calcium, oh, we've got more than where we didn't put any. Um, sulfur, uh, where are we? Oh, I didn't have sulfur on there. Magnesium, oh, we've got three times more where we haven't put any on. Uh, potassium, uh, where are we, potassium? Oh, yep, and three times more we haven't put any on. Um, P, oh, well, 121. Mm. <clears throat> Uh, nitrogen, that's not in that test. Look at our pH difference. It's huge. Where's, where's the benefit? Well, I, have put, I did put three times one on. Both of those two, eh? No, one on the average at the start. Yeah. then got one time on the start. And then the conventional, I put another two time on. So you put two ton of lime on here as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ashley, don't kill the dog. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm just wondering where the benefit is. That's all I'm wondering. So we start looking at our root depth, and you'll, we'll see when we go out into the, into the paddock, and um, you'll see 
I'm sure you can see in terms of cuts inside of the farm as you're driving along, there's not really much topsoil here. And if you are in this district, you'll know there's not much topsoil here. Um, so this is, our, this is our root depth millimetres that we've been measuring over time. So we're just getting deeper and deeper roots happening. Here's a visual of it. So we've got about seven centimetres there and 15. I know what I'd like going into a drought. So these are some of the other benefits that we've seen and you've all got a handout and like I say, it's kind of my preliminary working so far so we will we'll release really a, um, a good robust publication eventually. But I didn't have time between Thursday and Monday. So. so then it comes down to how much does that all cost me. This, this you know, hand harvested, sustainable, incredible seaweed sounds pretty friggin' expensive. The truth is it came out at half the, pro half the cost of our conventional um, system. So if you are doing 100 hectares, that's $20,000 extra for you in your back pocket. If you're doing 200 hectares, you've got an extra $40,000 in your back pocket. You've got better MEs, you've got more molybdenum in your pasture, you've got more magnesium in your pasture, you've got more potentially available nitrogen in your soil, you've got yeah, uh, it's... Quick question there. Yes. In the split paddock, or are you going to talk about it uh, which side of the paddock are the cow strays? That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, that... I have a moment. Yeah, I've but... actually used my methods on that paddock. It's two hectares. And it's quite a small paddock for us. And to be honest, I didn't really know much different from grazing. Mm. Do you watch if they go into paddock? Watch whether they're two A side or C side. Um, cows always go as far as they can. So I always see far back. The seaweed side, you mean? Um, <laughs> it just happens to me? No, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. I didn't notice that, but I did do notice because we've done chicory this year in summer crops. Towards the end of the chicory season, we have been on a five days. It's sort of getting sick of it. Um, the, the salad powder, they just dip it. And it's lovely. So that's the biggest thing. Mm. Mm. So are there, are there any other questions? We're going to go out and see some of these kind of um, paired sites and, and we're, I think we're going to spend most of our time in our diverse pasture because it's pretty friggin' incredible. Um, we were here over the weekend, Christine and I and, and, and Maya and Jenny, and I, I don't know how many holes we dug. What do you reckon, Taylor? Probably about 50. We just couldn't believe it. We just, no, it must be wrong. Have another, oh, no, no, must be over here. Like, it's just outstanding. Um, so I think we're really, I think generally that's kind of seems to be what interests people a lot is looking at this kind of diverse pasture and how that works. So that's kind of been the feedback that I've got. So, um, no, so we had three applications of soil and pasture nutrition mixed together. Yeah, five each time. Did you get a drought insurance? No. <laughs> <laughs> You, 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 if you were driving through this country at this time of year, you'd know if we'd had a drought this season. We still wouldn't be this green, no way. Any other, any other questions, or are we ready to kind of make a new friend and jump in someone's car and, and head out to the sites? Cool? Awesome. All right. Let's get friendly.